Welcome to a special edition of Hard Talk from Western Poland, where forces from more than 20 NATO countries have joined the host country for what is the biggest military exercise on European soil since the end of the Cold War. And it comes at a sensitive time, with East European nations increasingly nervous about the intentions of Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. Well, my guest today is the outspoken commander of the US Army in Europe, General Ben Hodges. Is NATO ready to respond to any Russian threat? Swooping over the plains of northwest Poland, on the ground, an elaborate war game simulating an invasion of NATO's northeastern flank. General Hodges, this is a little map of Europe that you travel with. And when you look at this, what do you see? It's useful to appreciate the geography. The fact that Russia can deny access up into the Baltic Sea affects eight countries that are either allies or friends. And, and what, I, what I also take from this map is that Poland is strategically an extraordinarily important place. Geographically, it's, it's almost like a keystone, if you will, from, from the top end of the alliance, Estonia down to uh, Bulgaria, as far as the border with uh, the east goes. So you're right. No matter if there was a crisis in Romania or a crisis in Estonia, we're going to have to pass through Poland airspace and on the ground. Operation Anaconda was a 10-day exercise designed to showcase NATO's rapid response capability. Hundreds of paratroopers were airdropped into the fight. Heavy armor roared across the Polish plains, and infantry showcased their urban warfare training. NATO has 28 members. They use different equipment, train differently, speak different languages. And they face to the east a Russian leadership ready and willing to flex its military muscle. Across the eastern border, the Russians will be watching this. And the Russians say when NATO puts these big, big exercises on, pretty close to our doorstep, it is nothing more than a provocation. Well. Our president said we'll defend all of our NATO allies. Uh, the best way to prevent a crisis from happening is to show that you're ready. And so this exercise is part of showing that we're, we're going to do what it takes to be prepared. And when I see <clears throat> the big screen presentation from the Polish uh, commander here, and he's talking about the red enemy, and he's talking about the red enemy taking the Baltic states and operating hybrid warfare tactics in northern Poland, you know, it does seem to be a pretty clear, blatant message to Moscow that you believe that's on Moscow's agenda. Well, I think political leaders all over the alliance have, have been saying that. I mean, if, Russia is who changed the security environment. You invaded Georgia, invaded Ukraine. Um, they, uh, they scare the hell out of people in the Baltics and in Poland. Every country I go to, that was a former Soviet Republic or former Warsaw Pact member or is a neighbor of Russia absolutely believes that this is a very real possibility. Do you believe it? I absolutely believe it's a possibility. They only respect strength. And defensive strength is exactly what Operation Anaconda was designed to showcase. The Germans and the Brits built a bridge over the river Vistula in hours. NATO wants Moscow to see this and be deterred by it. The generals declared their war game a success, but there's no disguising the nervousness in Eastern Europe. There is a very strong whiff of public relations about everything that's happening here. The Polish government is very keen to deliver two clear messages. One, they are doing their bit to secure Europe's eastern flank, but number two, they desperately want the Americans to stay committed to NATO. Poland is one of the few countries to meet NATO's target on military spending. But post the Ukraine crisis, Warsaw feels vulnerable. 
I think the most of the countries which are on the east uh, border of the NATO uh, would like to have the Americans, Brits and other forces in uh, their own territory. So we are not the any exception from the other countries on the east border but, of NATO. So sure, but when, like you, when you say to the Americans, we would like you to station permanent forces here, yeah. what do they say to you? Uh, of course, if we discuss about the, the military, so there is not any problem. But the final decision depends, as always, on the politicians. This massive exercise was brought to a close with brave words about readiness and resolve. But NATO's 28 members are beset with economic and political difficulties. The security threats facing Europe are changing fast, and the alliance is struggling to keep up. General Ben Hodges, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you, Stephen. Are you ready to tell me where you think the weaknesses are in NATO's capability today. You must have learned a lot from the last 10, 12 yeah. days. Where, where are you worried right now? Uh, the thing I worry about the most is freedom of movement. Um, the Russians are able to move huge formations and lots of equipment a long distance very fast. Uh, their snap exercises that they do, um, I personally am surprised each time they do it. Uh, and so you can see why that, that scares You mean me. about the speed and scale that they can bring to bear? Yeah, well, when they 20,000 troops, you know, a lot of equipment shows up on the border of a NATO country or maybe a, somebody like Georgia or Ukraine. Uh, that is concerning. Uh, the Russians have what uh, we call freedom of movement on interior lines. They can move anywhere inside Russia as fast as they want. In order for our political leaders to have options other than a liberation campaign, we need to match that same speed inside NATO. You don't have that speed today. No, uh, we need the, what I would call a military Schengen zone that would allow the military to move inside. A British convoy, an American convoy, a German convoy should be able to go anywhere inside uh, NATO in order to have the same freedom of movement. And I'm talking about three days. Three days notification, we ought to be able to do that. We absolutely don't have that right now. I think that's a necessary part of uh, uh, this deterrence, that the alliance is shifting from assurance to deterrence. So that you're saying speed. that right now, and in a very frank way, you're saying that right now you do not have deterrence because the enemy, and that, that's what you've called the Russians, no, they, they know that you can't do that. Deterrence is in the mind of the potential adversary, obviously. We absolutely do have deterrence, but I'm uneasy about my ability to assemble quickly or for others to be able to assemble quickly, um, and, and so I'm going to continue trying to explain why this matters. It's, it's not for our convenience, it's for uh, the ability to give political leaders options short of having to do a liberation campaign. You have said in the recent past, we have a grave lack of combat aviation. You've also talked of the weaknesses in terms of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capability. At one point you said, you know, we have no short range air defense anymore. So things that shoot down UAVs, that is drones, unmanned aerial vehicles, you go from Patriot missiles to an M4 rifle. There is nothing in between. You're a guy who is exposing the weaknesses of your own side. Mm -hmm. So I think I have a duty to make sure that our uh, policymakers and uh, planners understand clearly exactly where we are. Now, um, these are all decisions that have to be made, priorities that have to be made. Uh, the U.S. Army is continuing to shrink. Uh, these are political decisions based on uh, budget. From your point of view, are they the wrong decisions? I don't have enough capacity to do everything that needs to be done, but my Army Chief has said that. You don't have enough capacity. Previous Supreme Allied Commander has said that. Uh, we need combat aviation. We need short-range air defense. Uh, we need long-range fires. But this is, a, I mean, this is an extraordinary thing you're telling me. You well, it's, it's not news. But Army leadership has been saying this. Uh, same well, that, thing. that, in a way, is the point, General. You know, Senior top brass have been saying it month upon month, year after year, and it ain't being delivered. Uh, I think it is. I think uh, it'll never be as fast as I would like to see it. But again, my, my country is going to spend $3.4 billion bringing equipment back into Europe. Um, 
as a response to what we see as a, a threat that wasn't there, or we didn't really see it. I didn't see it that way until they went into Ukraine. And that's when the Russians went to Ukraine, that was when it became very real. So uh, in the great scheme of things, mm. it's actually a significant uh, step by my government. Yes. But I would put it to you that your East European partners within NATO want a whole lot more than you're giving them. You know, the Obama administration talks about reassurance and a reassurance initiative, but putting one brigade back into Europe isn't going to do it. You know, the Polish president has made it plain. He wants to see U.S. forces permanently based, mm. permanently based in Eastern Europe. Is that going to happen? I think what we'll see coming out of Warsaw uh, is specifics on which nation is going to do what with these enhanced forward presence battalions. Secretary General Stoltenberg, of course, just recently uh, made that announcement that there would be uh, an increase in uh, NATO troops that are in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Permanently based U.S. forces? There will be a rotational presence. Ah. Rotational. Because you see, again, President Duda, his words, not mine. We do not want to be a buffer zone. We want to be the real eastern flank of this alliance. And mm -hmm. by that, he means we don't want forces in West Germany or somewhere else which can be in emergency sent towards us and it's going to take days for them to get there. We actually want real commitment, men and materiel, on our territory. Number one, my president has said we will defend all of our NATO allies. That's, that's never been in question. Uh, but what, what if they don't believe him anymore? Well, I think they do. Uh, and we're going to continue to exercise here. We're going to continue to um, do things that improve the overall secu collective security of this most successful alliance in the history of the world. Now, part of what makes NATO, uh, and I'm speaking to you as a U.S. Army officer, mm -hmm. U.S. Army Europe, uh, but of course we are the contribution to NATO. Uh, from the U.S., a part of that. It's a collective security alliance, 28 nations. Not every one of the 28 sees all the same threats. If, if, you're, in the, if you're in France, Italy, Spain, or Greece, you're seeing a massive immigration problem and Islamic extremism uh, as the main threat. So uh, the alliance is not about just putting, lining up all of our troops on the border with uh, Belarus or Russia or, in, or Ukraine. It's about collective security. So uh, positioning decisions that the, uh, our leaders will make here over the next few weeks will reflect that and maintaining the unity of the alliance. President Putin's number one objective is absolutely to tear apart that unity of our alliance. And so decisions will be made that won't be ideal for every country, but they are, will be the best to maintain the unity of the alliance. That's what I believe. You say Putin wants to tear apart the alliance. He, he can't stand the alliance. Do you, as a very experienced infantryman general, now the head of US Army in Europe, do you believe that the Russians over the next, say, five years have a game plan to assert their military presence, frankly, to undertake military aggression against the Baltic states or other parts of the Western-backed eastern flank? I think they started in 2007 with a modernization effort and uh, with a mobilization effort to be in a place where they have the capability uh, to conduct any sort of operation to assert influence, whether it's uh, against a perceived provocation, which I don't believe that's their narrative, um, or to assert control and influence over what they think is their rightful sphere. So, uh, and Andrew Monahan from Chatham House has done a lot of good work explaining this mobilization, not in the old sense of mobilizing troops, but of all the institutions of government as well as forces being at a level of, at a level of readiness and modernization that would, enable, that would enable them to conduct sustained operations. But this is also within the context of, of hybrid warfare. It won't be like what I grew up against in the 80s, long lines of Russian tanks and a massive assault and artillery like that, although that could be a part of it. Instead, if there ever is a crisis, it will be within a nasty cyber environment. Uh, the 
misinformation, all elements of national power, information, economic, as, as well as uh, military. We have seen over recent months a series of worrying incidents. We've seen uh, U.S. Uh, naval vessels being sort of buzzed by Russian aircraft very close. We've right. seen incidents in Scandinavia which have involved uh, naval vessels. Uh, it, there's a sense in which the Russians appear to be pushing the envelope. Do you fear there is a real possibility of maybe inadvertent military confrontation between NATO, Western forces, and Russian forces in this neighborhood? Yeah, I'm sure I'm concerned about that. During the Cold War, it was common that you know submarines tailed each other, airplanes shadowed each other, uh, but there was sort of a uh, almost an unwritten protocol about what was what was acceptable because everybody wanted to avoid a mid-air collision um, or submarines bumping into each other and and all the negative things that would come out of that um, what seems a little bit different this time uh, or recently is the what I would describe as unprofessional um, to to fly that close to aircraft to do certain maneuvers. Now, I'm an infantry soldier, so I'm not an expert on flying or, or maritime operations, but even a pedestrian observer can tell that this is very unsafe. You know, Russia wants to be treated like a global superpower. Uh, they should act responsibly, and that's, that's not responsible. What is extraordinary is to reflect upon the fact that in 2012, the Obama administration took a strategic decision to draw down, significantly draw down, U.S. forces in Europe. I think we all thought that Russia was going to be a partner. Uh, that was certainly the, uh, the hope of this administration, previous administrations. Uh, you remember President Bush meeting with uh, President Putin, uh, then Prime Minister Putin. Um, I remember Russian soldiers being with us in uh, Bosnia when the I-4, the implementation force, went in to enforce the Dayton Peace Accords. You so, mean you, you, you for years got it wrong, is that what you're saying? No, what I'm saying is that Russia has changed. That uh, They had the opportunity, they had a, a seat at the table, and we want them to have a seat at the table. Uh, but somewhere in 2008, the invasion of uh, Georgia, uh, the use of force to change the border of, of a European country, Ukraine, the things that they're doing, uh, on the on their periphery, that's what's that's what's changed, and so the alliance is responding to that. The United States is responding to that. Today, you see Russia as the enemy, right? I see it as the only potential threat that could destroy the United States or the UK or Germany or any other country because of their nuclear force. And they talk about nuclear weapons a lot in exercises. They've threatened Denmark, Sweden. Poland and Romania with, nu with being nuclear targets. But that doesn't mean that they're going to do it. So there's a difference between having the capability to destroy the United States. Islamic extremists, Daesh, they have said they, want, they hate everything about us. They want to destroy the United States. They want to destroy the UK. They want to destroy France. They don't have the ability to do it. But we're going to be dealing with them for, for decades. Let's stick with okay. Putin for now. Um, it just seems to me that the context in which we talk, that is of, you know, a generation ago, 300,000 U.S. troops stationed in Europe, and today pretty much 30,000. It has sent an extraordinary message to the Russians. It has told the Russians that the United States government no longer has the will or the intention of investing in the security of Europe. Yeah, well, obviously I completely disagree with you on that. Uh, the fact is we are bringing equipment and troops back, back into Europe. Uh, our government has also made it clear to our allies that they have a responsibility to uh, take on more of a share, and frankly, the, the allies are, are stepping up. At the well, Whale, but they're not, though, are they? Well, sure they are. At the Wales Summit, all 28 nations agreed that they would increase the quality and sophistication of training, that they would begin to take on more responsibility, and the most well-known metric of the 2% of their right. GDP. And uh, how many of those countries are actually meeting that 2% target today? Today, I think we're at five. Five uh, out of 28. They gave themselves 10 years to do this. So we're only not even two years from Wales. So I think, let's keep that in mind. And I think the number that are 
either increasing or have stopped the de decline is around 23 of 28. I mean, I appreciate that you need to be, for the purposes of sending signals to Moscow, you need to be a guy who is talking about a glass half full rather than half empty. But you yourself said not so long ago, my task right now is to make 30,000 US troops look and feel like 300,000. And correct. if that is the best you can do, Vladimir Putin is not going to be impressed by that. I think he's impressed so far. Uh, our 30,000, of course, is what's stationed here. Uh, creating opportunities in the way the U.S. Army has responded by providing more reserve component forces to come over for exercises. The fact that my government is going to spend $3.4 billion just in next year, if the Congress approves it, to uh, improve training, improve capability. So we are responding. But I've seen you know, the U.K., of course, uh, has maintained that 2%. Uh, they will be the lead nation for the NATO Very High Readiness Joint Task Force next year. You say the UK is one of your most staunch, loyal partners. They are cutting, the, the Cameron government is co committed to cutting the army size from roughly 100,000 a couple of years ago down to 80,000 by 2020. When you see that sort of cut, does it worry you about the UK's ability to deliver the support you need? Every army chief has to balance three competing requirements. The size of the force, the readiness of the force, and the modernization of the force. And so if you have an army that's at a certain size in order to maintain that structure, you have to rob from your own modernization accounts or maybe from the readiness accounts, which means training, maintenance, and so on. So what matters to me um, is less the size and more the, the quality and capability. Uh, Chief of the General Staff, uh, General Nick Carter, of course, is uh, one of the most creative and innovative uh, officers I've ever known. And he's figuring out how, with whatever structure he has, how does he make sure that it's organized to deliver the effect? Well, that may be so, but independent analysts are looking at it and they don't like what they see. Chatham House, for example, has said that there is a real danger of UK military capability being, quote, hollowed out. Robert Gates, former defense secretary in the US, a guy that you obviously know very well, he has said that if the cuts go through, the UK can no longer be regarded as a full spectrum military partner. Mm. There is real concern, isn't there? None of us has enough. No country has enough land forces to do everything that it's being asked to do. There is a school of thought in your country, and maybe the loudest expressor of this school of thought is Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican nominee, that, in his word, NATO is obsolete and that it's not really needed anymore, and that the United States need not be investing huge amounts of money, men, and materiel in NATO anymore. The economic relationship between the United States and the EU is about five times more than it is anywhere else in the world. So if for no other reason, stability and security in Europe affects, is important to our own economic prosperity. The most reliable allies we have all come from Europe as well as Australia and Canada. And we have learned over the past several decades that we can't do anything by ourselves. We don't have the capacity to do anything by ourselves. We are always going to need allies, partners. Europe is where they come from. So common values, um, shared collective security commitments, I think that's going to, that has survived for almost 70 years. And I actually feel uh, that we're going to be able to continue that. General Ben Hodges, thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Stephen. I enjoyed it.